Welcome back to the Max Weber lecture series of this academic year. It's hard to think of a better lecturer to, or a better speaker to start the lecture series this year than um, Ramon Marimon, who was the founding director of the Max Weber program when it kicked off in 2006. I'll now leave the floor to Harry Begg, one of our current fellows who will tell you more about uh, Ramon's achievements and his background and research. So please, Harry. Great, uh, thank you all for joining. Um, so as um, you have uh, alluded to, the uh, uh, speaker today has, is a familiar figure uh, around campus, uh, Professor uh, Ramon Marimon has been uh, involved in the EUI system for uh, many decades. Uh, he is one of Spain's foremost economists, uh, currently a professor of economics at Pompeo Fabra, uh, as well as affiliated uh, to the Barcelona School of Economics. That's a role he's heard, held since 2006. Uh, but before this and throughout his career, he has had uh, numerous professorial roles at the EUI, uh, including uh, as Pierre Werner Chair at uh, the Robert Schumann Center. Uh, he took his PhD from Northwestern in 1984 uh, and has made path-breaking contributions uh, to a range of areas uh, from macroeconomics uh, to monetary theory and uh, European political economy. Uh, he also served in the Spanish government in the early 2000s. Um, he is also the, as uh, you have said, the founding director of the Max uh, Faber program and is therefore uh, sort of responsible in many ways for making it the program, uh, the celebrated program that it is today. Uh, and today he's presenting his lecture, Historical Evolution and Dynamic Mechanism Design, uh, the Macroeconomics of the EU. So we are really uh, looking forward to approximately uh, 60 minutes of uh, this talk, uh, followed by about 30 minutes uh, of uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramo. Thank you, thank you, Perry. It's a real pleasure to give a Max Weber lecture because it's the first time I give a Max Weber lecture. Uh, yeah, someone asked me, oops, this is not moving now. What happened here? Okay. It's not moving. Oh, here it is. Why, no? Am I so proven? And I had been before the UI uh, in the 90s, actually, before I started the Pumpo Fabra. And by that time, I was between Barcelona and Florence commuting. And it came out uh, an advertisement of a new PhD, I own a postdoctoral program here in the economies. So I saw it and my daughter said, you have to apply, so I applied. And then I think, okay, why? Because postdocs, we have plenty in the natural science and people go to the lab and work. But in social science and humanities, it's usually defined for what you are not. You are not a doc, you are not a prof, and you are likely to be alone. So, not only that, I mean, since I was involved with the uh, Paul Fabra and hiring people, you can see it from the other side, and sometimes you see someone is in a postdoc, and you even don't know whether this person is going to uh, will have some papers, whether this person is going to be able to teach and do things or whatever. Okay, so then that's uh, I thought in organizing it in a different way and have it a more structural problem that will be defined by not the negative, but why what it was able to do. So to give identity to that period of the career, because we're producing a lot of PhDs in Europe and there were not that many jobs. So it was obvious that the postdocs in social science and humanities are gonna be growing. So I thought let's do it like this. 
the idea of having a postdoc was not mine, was many the, the uh, really good president of the, uh, and the guy said one thing I'm concerned at that time, there were few postdocs, very few. He says, well, all the departments fire for a high, I mean, there's like, they all went one, the postdocs, but when they are come here, no one pays attention to them and they're alone, okay, so. So here's what I did, okay, and that, so I'm just quoting what the self-evaluation report that the guys had been working and it just, I think, was nice because pretty much what they were thinking from the beginning. So we make it unique. So it will be for the training, but not only for the training, it's the idea will be to use this fact that you have finished your thesis and you are not so busy with teaching and many other things as you will be when you're in position to think more about what the academic is and in a multidisciplinary environment and not a particular national system. So let me say a few things over this one. The first year, all the applications talk about Max Weber. Even it was clear there was not a program about Max Weber, but whatever people were doing, they were doing related to Max Weber. Now it's not like this. People realize that it's different. But in any case, it was good to see what Max Weber was saying. Nothing is worthy of a man as a man unless he can pursue this with passionate devotion. Probably now we'll have to say a man and a woman, okay? Because, but anyway, that's the, those were the times. And then he will say, every young man who feels called to scholarship has to realize that the task before him has a double aspect. He must qualify not only as a scholar, but also as a teacher. Max Weber said. Thanks, Mac, but we need to understand how and where. So then how do we organize a lot of workshops? From ethics to the history, teaching, training, the certificate, things that now have expanded also through academic services, through the whole UI, but also the where. And then we started the Academic Careers Observatory because I found myself that people were getting offers to get a job even in Spain, but have a clue of what an academic career can be in Spain or something, or even wanted to compare salaries or something. So that's another thing we did. As a way also to think more about how academia was evolving in Europe, with also some research about uh, research funding and so on. And so that's what it is. Multidisciplinary environment. And this was the first lecture but for Harf, October 4th, 2006. And he quoted, uh, he said, Weber rejected the belief that the social science should emulate the natural science in their search for the low-like generalizations that might ultimately lead to a system of proposition from which reality can be deduced. I think it was a little mesmerized by natural science. I think he took it too strict what Weber was saying. Because at the end, we are not that different. Social science and humanities is also subject to induction a deduction. Induction, the dictionary says, the process of inferring general law and principles for observing particular instance, opposed to deduction. But deduction, reasoning from general particular is opposed to induction. And in this interaction, I think you have understanding these basically as philosophers like David Hume, but also in social science and humanities contributed. And now neuroscience does. Because they tell us that the brain is very creative, it's not simply processing information, it's just creating new things. But it doesn't have a ob clear objective, but it has something very important, which is how to better adapt your body or whatever. Okay, and that's a good principle. And also we all try to transform what will be subjective beliefs or prejudices into more objective beliefs and truth, confusion into clarity. I think Al Popper had it right, says the process of learning or the growth of subjective knowledge is always fundamentally the same. It's imaginative criticism. And Nobel Prize Wilson will talk about consilience. 
and again, the dictionary will say it's the agreement between uh, the approaches to a topic of different academic subjects, especially in science and humanities. And also you recognize actually social science are not very good at doing that, okay? So you can take it a very pragmatic approach to what I thought about the Marx program, which is the kind of thing. So more thinking that was a way to have imaginative criticism on research, teaching, on across disciplines, in a way that maybe we use con conciliance among people of different disciplines. So so much for the most part. Oh uh, no, also if you look at the, the global environment, just have to look at the map. You have Max Air programs all over the place. So join them and sure you call someone and my Max Air program will be happy to say hi and so on. But let me go to the topic. As you all know, it was out of war and destruction that the European Union has a commitment to growth and peace as in the origin of another union. So that's what Jan said, Europe will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solution adopted for those crises, induction and deduction. But it was a slow learning process. It was not joint defense. And actually, that was the first thing that was discussed. It was about coal and iron and the single market, the free movement of people, goods, and capital. <clears throat> the extent of the market, so we learn from Adam Smith. But it took long. In the 1970s, Pierre Werner was in charge to write the Pierre Werner report, of course, of the team because it was already understood that if you have a single market, sometimes it's not a very good idea to have too many currencies, okay? So you wanted to have that the whole goods and services move without competitive distortions, competitive devaluations, okay? And that will result in structural regional disequilibrium. It was slow, but meanwhile, we also have progress in our case in economics. Macro was basically starts with Keynes with the idea that we can understand and think about aggregate. And then we're gonna have first accounting systems. And, but Keynes will say by continuing process of inflation, government can confiscate secretly and, and observe it an important part of the wealth of citizens. Bob Lucas, uh, you can see that. And then here's what Tom Sargent will say, rational expectations undermines the idea that policymakers can manipulate the economy by systematically making the public have false expectations. So we start thinking much more seriously about the effect on expectations on our policies. And after all, that's something that, yes, on this we are different from natural science, because in natural science, you always have the past affecting the future. If I have a motion, it goes to the future. With expectations, the future shapes all of our decisions too, through the expectations. So I want to talk about Bob because he left us this year and really made the major contributions. So did Ed Prescott, who also left this year. And they got the Nobel Prize, one of the reasons, not the only one, what is called the timing consistency problem. And they have in the original paper, this little tale about, if you have a river and you put the house in the river bend and there will be floodings, so maybe you should not do that. But if you know that anytime there's a flooding, here we come and we help you and you build up a new house, you are gonna keep putting houses in the river pen and we're gonna keep having to spend money on that. Of course, that seems like a very silly idea, 
or very simple. So you say, well, how the hell do you get the Nobel Prize for that? Well, yes. Make us not only that, I said, but it's to make us think about more seriously how we do policies and how we design institutions. In particular, if we want to avoid uh, these uh, inconsistent, time inconsistent policies in monetary policy, maybe you have an independent central bank away from the hand of the policymaker who wants to do something every time. So that was what we call type one of time inconsistency, I will call it, because it's something hits you in the face immediately. And if you look at before, then there were many understanding that since the 70s, you have to do that. To put it on, on hold for a long time because there were more urgent things to do. But eventually a team of really professionals built up what is going to be the European system of banks and the, the central bank. But we have these spreads before the central bank gets started. And then we could call that that time because we have this inflation as a conflict. Now we will call it, okay? Now, of course, once we have that bank, that was it. And with this, we arrived to this century which is the one I want to look. And this was, we had this period, the first eight years was very stable, as you've seen. And, and that very much was the idea of the design. They were gonna have stable prices, interest rates were low, and fiscal policy will be in the hands of the countries, but then we we're gonna have the master criteria and the stability growth pact. People will violate it too, once in, and so on. But that was fine. And also this role for the central bank was also consistent with the central banks in other places, except that the Federal Reserve Bank will have the treasury. Here there was no treasury. But except for that, they were just using their policies. Things change in banking in many things. But this was monetary union, okay? We have the monetary union with the central bank, and then we have the EMU, the, economy, the part of fiscal in the union, and here the only thing other than policies was the stability group back. As you all have seen this picture, so we had some noise before, we had much more after 2008. After financial crisis, we have this. And that's all called time two, time inconsistency. Because what? In this period that everything looked so smooth, things were happening. Some countries were borrow a lot because the interest rates were low. Public and private. There were countries like Spain that satisfied the master criteria, but there was a huge amount of private debt. The crisis came. They had all these expectations on getting revenues of all the taxes they were getting. The revenues were gone and the expenses were up immediately because there's unemployment, all kinds of things. So boom, the debt of Spain went like crazy. Ireland was even more radical because the banking system had to be rescued by the state and then boom. So that's where we had the crisis. And then here, so that's type one, type two, type three is for how long it came the carrot, okay? EMU on the, in particular that's drag in 2012. In 2010, we already had the crisis, very clear, but uh, it took us some time. And this had the major impact as if solving the, what we will call a self-fulfilling crisis. And we will think of this as an effect of the land of life resort. Of course, it was not just the speech he did in London. It was also that time the ECB, following the example of something was already doing, the Federal Reserve Bank, because the financial crisis was there since 2008, 
decided to have programs to buy unconventional policies, okay? And in this case, was even ready for the first time to buy government debt. And it was the creation of the ESM as a crisis resolution mechanism before there was the FSF for Greece. And that was sort of solved the Greek crisis. Okay. So now we have a larger union. We did it will also be a financial union. And within the fiscal union, we also had the ESM now and a sort of revised version of the stability and growth pack. But in a sense, you can think that any of these three was solving their own specific time inconsistency problems to be rich price stability, economic stability, and financial stability. The big player, of course, was the ECB, but it can't be overstretched. So here we have. So now we start here with uh, uh, the century and the euro, actually, both things at the same time, with a union that there was no need for resilience. But now we have ourselves that we needed for financial, something that was not even in the books, basically. And then we need the banking union and all that sort of stuff. But in particular, also, with respect to the debt, the sovereign debt, because now we had the problem, and also we had an overhang of the debt that is going to come out of that. We also had Brexit after that. So with this, we arrived to the COVID-19 crisis. And now that's different because in the sense that it's all over the world, we have our own version. And actually one of my co-authors uh, was in Wuhan, so I knew from the beginning about that. COVID. But it's true, it's this time there was also a reaction, similar to had done in other countries, but this time at the EU level, not only the national level, with the next generation EU, the first time that we have some resharing, like sure, uh, of unemployment. And then it's clear that health security becomes a, a public good at the European level. And at that time, then we start thinking also the green and digital and so on. But you see, in all this, we have changed quite a lot because what? We thought at the beginning that there was not gonna be debt. There was not gonna be never bailout. Well, we had bailouts. We had some institutions, but not at the level that we were doing at this moment. Within the commission, there is the, all the financing of the next generation EU. So effectively, is like a temporary treasury, okay, uh, that we establish here. So here is now a more complex version of that, because in particular we have this new. It's not a new institution, but this budget in, in charge of that. But that's what it is. Progress was being done with the banking union and capital markets, but not so much, okay? There is not a, a deposit insurance, a full deposit insurance of the, the union and so on. But now we even arrived to the last two years and then we have the Ukraine invasion. And the first time we have inflation with the Euro. So now the, need of resilient union is like everyone takes for granted. Okay, so the sort of public goods now in back that's something we're supposed to talk from the beginning, but we never did in a serious way in defense. In addition, we have the problem of regulation. Okay, and so we have all these debts now that we didn't have before and also a lot of commitments, which are long-term commitments. Ukraine is a case. So this is how things change very rapidly. 
Okay. And that gives us five legacies. Okay. The first one is that the euro area of union divide. See, if we, I love this graph, okay. And so here, if we, so everything is normalized in the 2008. So everyone is here. And then you see the beginning, there was, and then we put here what? We have Japan, United Kingdom, and United States. But then we have the area divided in two. The stressed countries, okay? Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, and the non-stressed countries. An idea of the union was that we're gonna have the union, and particularly the monetary union, and we're gonna have conversions. Well, if this was the metric, it has been a complete disaster because we are much more unequal than we were before. Actually, this week came out the region, regional outlook for the SCD, and these four countries are the only four countries that per capita the income per capita has gone down since the year 2000. And it has gone down even respect to the average of the OECD. So that's an issue. In particular, because for example, at the early 2000s, they were like the president's report, okay? And they were agreeing what needed to be done. And they always say, oops, so they always say, we'll talk about a problem with the monetary union is, is that it's not a federal state. In a federal state, there is a lot of resharing that goes through the budget, okay? So it's a particular state, a lender or something has a problem. You're gonna be collecting less income, less income from the taxes, but you're gonna provide the services. A problem we have in Europe is that we gave up on the monetary part, but we don't have that. So it was easily always recognized that you will need to do something more, okay? Like in some, but then they will say, yes, but let's wait that we converse. Well, if you wait to converse, you will never do something like that. But as I said, already in COVID, we start doing something of that sort. So, but then the problem, something that we know is when you have a crisis, it's not unlikely that the crisis will be bad for everyone. And it was fairly bad for everyone, but pretty much the same. But what is important is how you get out of the crisis. Because if it takes you longer, as it happened, then there is a gap and this gap will remain unless you grow much, much faster, which that's very difficult to do. And that's something the economists we understand quite well. So that's why then we are more unequal now than before. In particular, it has been unfortunate that COVID also has been bad for these four countries because they are heavy in tourism and you lock down all these activities. Okay. So, and if you put it separate, you'll see even more difference. And okay, that was Ireland, Oops, got out of that very quick, but Greece is like that. And then we have, of course, the sovereign debt legacy. And so that's had gone up. First we thought, okay, well, we're not a big deal because interest rates are low. And so we do R minor G, so R is so low, the G is growing, that will take care of it. Now, interest rates are back again with inflation. So the commission looks at high sustainability, sustainability risk countries those are the ones in red. The ones Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece, those are the stress countries. They're all here there. And then so medium and low. And here it also says how much is forecast in 2024. Okay, for this now French is going to be more that actually at, as of today is already more than Spain. But for all of them, the cost are important. 
Okay, so this is how much it is the cost for GDP. If you can spend the 3% of GDP, when I was in the government, the thing that we decided in the presidency of Spain in 2002 was that at that time it was all about a competitive economy in the world. And by 2010, okay, we were supposed to arrive to a 3% expenditures on R&D. Uh, that didn't happen, okay? But if we were to spend 3% on R&D or whatever, and then, and countries like, but not only that, and now you see, as I said, thanks to next generation EU, well, thanks to next generation EU, that means also in the, these two years, a lot of issue. And this now is that also of the EU. So it's gone basically from nothing to 400 billion. So it's substantial. As a matter of fact, this is the resilience and reform facility, which is the thing that uh, is the largest land, official lender in the world now. But this also means that even for the union as such, that there is a cost. This is a, a little royal paper for the parliament. This is how much the commission said, but the estimate is double of that on the budget of the EU, which is a, not a large budget in percentage, but is what we have, okay? But then we also have this that one thing that we're not counting before is that now it's a, the menu of public goods at the European level is huge. Not only defense, health, but also going to get to the new challenges on climate, management education, aging, in a population that is aging, you don't want to have the green, the digital, and the right transition. So all those is what we'll call the type three time inconsistency of fiscal policy, because now it's a more long term. So next generation you, I love the title because it means we think about next generation of future. But unfortunately we act many times voting with the current generation food. And even countries were supposed to do big reforms like in, us, in the case of Spain, uh, for pensions, nothing there. So, and that gives us to, to the fifth of the legacies. For the first time, now is thinking geopolitically. And this to a large extent has happened because what happens in the world and in particular now we have Ukraine, the Russian Ukraine invasion. So we are thinking about how the role we're gonna play in the role as a union, but actually when internally populism polarization is on the rise. As we speak, tomorrow they have the meeting in Granada and Louis Paroli they will approve a plan to go from 27 to 35. And then there's, of course, on this, many things will need to change. So, okay, so much for induction, time for deduction. Wow, yes. So here it is. So I've been working on the stuff. We had the one time when the project of the union, of the commission, and we call it a demo. And, and they just working about European Stability Fund. And I will think it in two steps. First is how you do it now with the current institutions. And second, how you should do it, particularly that now they're gonna think a lot about what needs to be changed. And this is basically three papers of theory and one on policy that we did with Adrian Witch, which is over there, is uh, finishing the PhD, already submitted, okay? And, but we started with the first one in this demo project with uh, ARPAD was a faculty here then, Eva Cassis and Jan Louis is the other co-author in Wuhan. And then we did another one also, now with Adrian and Jan, and a more recent one with uh, people of the also DSM. 
One thing I didn't say before is that in the legacy of the dead, actually one third is in EU Euro area institutions. In some countries, more than 60%, like Greece, but in all, it's a substantial part. Okay? But those are in different institutions for different programs. We don't have a EU or Euro area policy for what to do with this, that, or how to manage the whole thing. So, and here is where it comes, the mechanism design. So here the idea is to say, well, I want to design, that's how we work, economies. And, and that's also something that Lucas will say. And there was in a panel with him and they say, okay, what is new and macro? And he said, mechanism design. To think about institutions or mechanisms that, and, and then, of course, to understand that there are many constraints that can to be fulfilled. And here, in fact, I'm going to put seven, which is a lot of constraints. The first one is the sovereignty constraint. Means this is not a federal state. It's a union of sovereign states. An exit, as we've seen, can happen. But maybe you would like to not the right to the extreme of exit because it might not have been a very efficient thing. And now, now a lot of Brexiters realize, some recognize it, some not, to have Brexit. Second one is what I call the high problem you don't want to have. So that's what Hayek will say. There is no future for the EMU. It will involve too much redistribution. To which Tom Sargent, this is in his novel, using dynamic mechanics as a mechanism design, there should be a future for the new one. So this is a constraint. You have designed it in a way that there's not going to be that mutualization or whatever. It's also moral hazard because part of the risk is how much effort you put in being more resilient to doing reforms or whatever. So you also have to account for that. And then there are others which are more institutional. As I said before, you see, what the world told is what will be nice is we are in the veil of ignorance when we do resharing, because one day if we are for good, the other for bad. Okay. And that's what Ramsey will say. Ramsey will say two things. You should think about you are in the veil of ignorance, and if you look towards the future, your discount factor should be one. You should be very patient. Okay? Well, we should be patient, I think, for future generations, but we cannot wait, as the president was saying, that we converge because that won't. So the first thing is we should be. A, find that deal with very asymmetric countries. And if we now go to 35, that will be even more asymmetric. So you cannot do designs that don't take this into account. And the asymmetry sometimes may be that they have huge legacies of debt behind. The other is that it cannot be a fund that you put the money up front because there is not that much money up front. Maybe you put guarantees, but the whole thing should be basically self-sufficient, self-funded. And then another one is that you don't want to intervene more than you should. We started with the market. We want things to work. Here, there are markets for debt, so you should let the private market work, okay? And finally, when we think about how we do it, we might have the problem that the institution might need some capacity. We'll come back to that. So what is the basic idea of the fund? The main instrument is a contract, okay? The same way that we have a DSM has debt contracts, 
have a particular debt contract for different countries, and they are specific to the country, they're specific of the risk of the country. So that's exactly what it should be. But it should be really long term. Why? Because this is a long term partnership. We design the central bank. This is going to be forever. You don't design a central bank for 15 years because it will never take off. So we still think in the fiscal side on the same way. Thinking institutionally that this is a long-term thing. So risk assessment will be very important. What is debt sustainability analysis? Those things will be important as they are recognized already. In what the idea is not to have these long MOUs, so basically not exempt conditionality. There may be a menu of menus, or a menu of contracts, depending on your risk. But this is very much what insurance companies do. They come to your house and say, okay, yes, but you know, that's how much it will cost you. But if you put this alarm system, which actually we can even provide the alarm system for you, then it will be much less. Okay? So that's the same thing. You might want to say, well, look at whether you change the pension system or not will give you different fiscal capacity. So we might have different programs for that. The idea is that it's not only a debt contract, but it's a state, so typical debt contracts will say just give you interest rate and then few years that they give you the debt in few years, as we they do it now with next generation EU, as we said, and then you pay it for 30 years or whatever you pay it. This is different because it's a contract long term and it will provide insurance free sharing. So we know that you're going to have shocks as we all. And, but also, you also take into account that you want to prevent default. And I want to be sure that there are no undesired transfers. Okay? So that's what we're gonna do here. So it might be that uh, I ha we have solidarity for specific cases, COVID, but short of that, it should be in this context that never, never means not at any time, not at any state, you expect to be losing. This has the advantage in a union that this immediately says that they're not gonna be undesired transfers. Okay. And you can design that and do it this way. And then as I said, you might want to have minimal intervention in that. What does it mean about this? Well, there are several types of crisis, okay? One, as I said, is that the country might want to default. At the beginning of the Greek crisis, there was, oh, Greeks is gonna exit. You have not thought about that. Greece had no incentive to get out and go back to the drachma, that would have been a, a huge disaster. Okay. But then the problem was is the German banks had a lot of Greek debt. So they were not very happy about that restructuring the debt either. So that's why we had to wait a couple of years and so on. So one thing is this, you have to keep track be sure there is no fundamental, what we call fundamental default. But as I said, the contract does already for you. Okay? And the guy, if you come tomorrow to the lecture, so I'll explain you more how you do it, but that's how you design that. But then what it can be, it can be that there are the different treasuries specialized basically in managing their debts. So, and then what they do it is they put an auction. Well, an auction 
might fail. So far, they are not failing here, but in the past, Mexico had failed and others, they had failed. So that's what we call a cell, a belief-driven rollover crisis. Why? You have to lower the debt because you have, and if people don't show up, and you're done. But this means that if we had not been a crisis, if the debt who had succeeded, the, the auction who had succeeded, because there was nothing fundamental. That's why I call what was happening in the euro crisis, it had an element of both things. There was problem of sustainability, but what they call liquidity, or we are missing. And then it's, you, if you can intervene there and not spend anything as happened with Draghi, that's a big job. So you have to be able, it needed, not to put it, at least to be able, as Draghi said, look at, I will take care of the gross financial needs there. And that will, the auction will be successful. So this is long-term debt. So Delta, let's go from zero to one. Zero is the high one period debt, and one will be perpetual. So you can immediately see that the gross financial needs are very high if you have one period of debt because every year you have to roll over to the debt. So the gross, but the longer they are, okay, the less. But then on the other hand, more outstanding debt is out there. If there was the way that we solve the problem is this, you say, sorry, if we were to get further, see we're going to have more debt, even if there are a lot of little private lenders offering you, you go beyond that, what you can cover. Why? Because how we pay debts, okay, that's called, uh, they will say the value of the debt corresponds to what you had been borrowing before, of course, but that's looking back. But if I look forward, I have to pay that with revenues. Which revenues? Well, primary surpluses. Okay, so we think of the value of the debt as the value of my future primary surpluses. In the same way that in a firm, we think the value of the firm as the present value of the dividends. Okay, but this means that what are we going to do as a fund? Because the fund will help, we'll be able to cover, but if it gets to a point where we we'll say, look at, we stop lending. But when the fund, because it's a player, an important player here, says I stop lending, everyone else will realize that the cake cannot be, or, or, there is no more for, room for more landing there, so stop. So it'll be like a sudden stop of landing. Now in this situation, to avoid that there is confusion, I should be able to say, well, I should be able to, if needed, absorb that. Okay, the existing long-term debt, and that's delta B, which this is increasing. So then we put that in the computer, Adrian does this, okay? And, and then we just find that it is an optimal level of maturity, okay? Where we minimize what will be these, these financial needs. But if we do it, and that we did it for Italy, it's like 90% is something percent of the GDP, plus it's substantial, okay? So that's when we might need some help. So the fund, like if I think of the SM, is not able to do, but the central bank might be able to do it. Okay, I'll come back to that. So what we do is we put these things in, so we, one solves the model and then put it in the computer, this is a dynamic thing. And then we do what we, I call it Prescott, induction, which is calibration. It's not only Prescott who did it, but there was one major person. So 
We will look at the economies in the first paper, we, uh, the stress economies, and for the period uh, 1980 to 2015. And we look at how these economies behave when they have defaultable debt without the, the fund. So then they did a great job to do this calibration. And then we say, okay, well, what about you? We had this fund context. What life will have been for them? Or in the other papers, we look at Italy, okay? And in all these cases, we get very substantial welfare gains. So let me look, tell you, I'm not, have a lot of time, tomorrow we'll show more pictures, that this is in the first paper looking at the euro crisis. So here what we simulate is a really, so here will be shocks to technology, this theta, and thanks to shocks, so big theta is like good times, but uh, low is very bad times. So here you have a big shock, oops, going all the way down. And this is on government liabilities. You suddenly might have really high liabilities, so that's a bad shock too. So we have these economies going through the back shock like this, and then we let them run, thousands of them, they go back to some steady state. If you look at output, there was a crisis. Okay, output went down. Actually, it went down even more. Red here is with the fun, blue is without the fun. With the fun, why? Because your productivity sucked, were really bad. You should not be putting a lot of work there either. Instead, consumption was really high. So why? Because you had a huge transfer, huge help. And why you have so much help? Because this was a very rare event. So in a rare event, you should be able to get a huge amount of help. And then of course, eventually you will pay it. But this is, so those one period here is 10, so it took, it takes 10 years. But meanwhile, okay, you had a much better consumption and everything. And here is the spreads. So the spreads in the economy without the fund. The economy fund, there are no spreads. Actually, there is a little negative spread. And so why the hell does this mean? Well, negative spread, because the negative spread is the signal to the market that you should not lend more you should stop lending. And this is what happens there. And then, I said I don't have time for a lot of pictures because I should get out of my time too. So this is a decomposition of what will have been Italy. Because I would eat Italy because Italy was not held by the SM and by no one because they don't want to be held, okay, so that's fine. And so here, what is, we decompose so this is the value of the debt, okay? When the, it's locks and so on. So here is, we were in the year 2000. Here is the debt of Italy, okay? But the debt of Italy, the value of the debt, I can be composed into things, the real cost and the primary surplus. Oh my God, I should take myself out of here. Okay, here it is. So this is R minor G. Okay, uh, so if R is higher than G, you're gonna have to borrow. And this is minus the primary surplus, the primary deficit. So I can decompose the debt of, into things. That was, wow. Italy was getting primary surpluses all the time. They had a very strict policy. The central bank and everything respected, they were, they were like the best guys on that. Maybe they overdid it. But the problem is the R minus G was terrible because G was very low. So we let them go without the fun in the computer. Actually, they will have not been so strict. And that will be pretty much what the deficits was a coin, accumulation of debts. Instead, 
This is with the fun. The fun has much more absorbing capacity with the fun, with the privates and so on of that than the other economy. And yet that was lower. Okay. So, and it was not as strict. So they were not using, because the problem with that, okay, was the type two, no contracyclical policies that they were awaiting too severe. They were in too austerity, too much, okay? So if I were to do it now, how you just think, okay, I'm almost done. Uh, so how can we do it now? Well, we already have these programs that they have country specific risk. Now, I only need that the program's a little bit more sophisticated with a state contingency, but this can legally be done. So what will we, what can we do now? Well, we have several pieces. One is the ESM already. For the EIB, it's only specialized, so that's why I put it, I'm not sure. But now we have this temporary treasury in the European Commission. Also, there's another division of, of director general uh, that does the debt sustainability analysis. So we also, so the idea is those are the components that you have to really coordinate and do policy together. Okay, now what happens if this together, for example, if there is not enough capacity, as I said, that's where the ECB comes. And this will be a perfect complementarity. Why? Because the SF contract will guarantee that the debt is safe. There is no belief-driven type of crisis here. The ECB now has a program called the Transmission Protect uh, Protection Instrument, TPI, but they can only use it if the debt out there is safe, okay? Because the balance sheet of the central bank or the system of central banks has to be safe, okay? So the fact that the contract is there guarantees that the debt is safe. Therefore, you can activate the, the TPI if needed. The TPI, the fact that if I the TPI gives enough capacity to the fund, which is what we needed. Okay, so that's it. If we did it, also now we are discussing the new stability and growth pact. Actually, it's, if you do this, you probably don't need it, but I think it's good that you can do that and it's better. But uh, what they don't have for these countries which are in the red before, that will be a great if you have a program like this, a contract like that, okay? And what about with the new EMU? Well, now it's, then we make it an institution. And if we were able to create institutions in the past, I think that now with all that we have, there is a need for this to be an institution. I said, okay, why don't you just let this uh, DG and the European Commission do it with it? Uh, well, no, uh, first of all, it's important there is one. But it's also important there is a little of independence. Okay? And the Commission, they have a lot of surveillance, but it's, it's very much political. Okay? So, for example, now you have all these things. Now we're going to say, okay, we're going to have to spend in defense, you have to spend on that, blah, 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 blah. It's important that there's someone to say, fine, okay, this is the repercussion that you have or not. Okay, so that's the idea there. Okay. And then now the ECB has someone to talk to. Okay. National policies, I said, will be remain. The policies of the EU will remain in the EU. But as I said, this fund has to certify those some things are consistent with long-term sustainability. 
And we also have a need for independent fiscal institutions playing a major role because it's important and other people do also the assessments and so on. So closing yeah here, the idea is that you see here, this is the monetary type one time inconsistency problem, the SF, that's the type two and type three, which is time inconsistencies, a medium term and long term. Yeah. There is an asset, the euro, which is the ECB is the gatekeeper. There is another one, which are the primary surpluses. That you have to look at the gate, the DSF has to be the gatekeeper. The primary mandate of the ECB is price stability without undesired monetary imbalances. The mandate of the ESF is the sovereign debt and new debt are sustainable without undesired debt mutualizations. So this is what she said the other day in the State of the Union. Europe once again must answer the call of history. Sure, let's have an ESF. And you guys make the best of your Max Weber fellowship.